Cayman Islands are world-renowned for two things. Banks and beaches. Yet there is another side of the Cayman Islands, made up of interior wall spaces and special historic places that make Cayman so unique, which often gets overlooked. It is this side that one small organization has been working tirelessly for the past three decades to preserve. That organization, the National Trust for the Cayman Islands, would not exist today had it not been for the foresight of the late Sir Vassal Johnson and his principal secretary at the time, Mr. Kearney Gomez. I have to give a lot of credit to Sir Vassal Johnson. Uh, he is Cayman's first and only knight, and he basically has had the foresight to see that uh, the Cayman Islands would need an organization or a vehicle to be able to receive gifts on behalf of the people of the Cayman Islands and hold them in trust for the people. That's when it came to him that the Cayman Islands needed a national trust, and that was 30 years ago. Besides just being this amazing financial guru, he's known as one of the financial fathers of the Cayman Islands because he helped put us in motion to where we are today financially. He, you know, really was able to have a balanced view of things. So he saw the need for development and progress, but he also saw the need for uh, preservation and preserving our culture and things that were important. And that's when he came up with the idea for the trust. He calls it in his book, uh, one of his greatest achievements. When Sir Vassal Johnson took the National Trust Bill to the Legislative Assembly in 1987, he said, it is said that from the earliest time, man recognized that God had given him certain possessions, which he should preserve. I brought the subject to Sir Vassal Johnson. He appreciated the need for conservation, preservation, and he made things happen. He didn't sit by the wayside and wonder why things happened. He made things happen. He, he fully supported it. And he said, get on with it, form a committee, an exploratory committee, and see where it will take us. And you know, I was um, fortunate to have someone like him as a minister. And we put a committee together. Um, back then, it was uh, Deborah Drummond, Joe Parsons, Joe Hevner, and myself. And eventually, it expanded to include uh, Dace Ground, who also was very influential in putting the whole thing together and also she was very influential in putting together the uh, marine parks that we enjoy here in the Cayman Islands today. Now we have something that we can be proud of. The people of the Cayman Islands can be proud of. The Caymanian culture is unique. My role in the uh, genesis of the National Trust was as chairman of the steering committee. We utilized uh, information from Bermuda because our trust is primarily based on the Bermuda National Trust. We were tasked with the responsibility of putting together the pros and cons of a national trust. Trust will play an integral role in the future of Cayman, and it must. We have the various agencies, planning and Department of Environment. Everybody must work together. Other countries in the world ensure that they protect their heritage. The future generations, I said, will be, won't have to ask, well, what happened then? How did we get here? Where did we come from? People come to these islands to immerse themselves in the culture of the country. The people, the architecture, the uh, environment on the whole. It is a major draw for tourism. The Trust has accomplished a lot. I must commend the Trust, and I think the National Trust is always open to new ideas, new concepts, and new members. The first property gifted to the National Trust by the courts was Fort George, a historic point of protection built in the 1700s. In the early 70s, a local developer became embroiled in a dispute with the Port Authority who at the time owned Fort George. At that time, the island was developing and we were becoming a burgeoning financial center. 
So Fort George was one of the, f the few fortifications around the island that kept Cayman safe during the days of World War II. Basically, this, was a, this photo shows a lookout house at the top of an old cotton tree where the current Fort George is, this tree used to be. That tree is no longer there today, so we've actually put it back up on a, a wooden pole to represent the lookout house. And a lot of people think it's just a really big bat house, but it isn't. It's actually an old lookout house where Cayman's homegrown military, so to speak, would actually use to make sure that our harbor was safe. So this developer decided to take things into his own hands and actually kind of start bulldozing part of that historic wall. And it was only when a handful of Caymanian citizens stood up to him did he actually stop. So they ended up saving a large portion of what we have today. If it were not for them, we probably wouldn't have had any of the historic remains left. So we should be grateful to those people who even back in the 70s had the foresight to say, this is something that should be saved. The second property gifted to the trust by the government was the 625 acres known as the Salinas in East End. We've been doing, with the National Trust, have been doing small-scale stuff a long time before that. It goes all the way back to about 1990. We were doing, we were doing some field surveys in the early 90s, mid-90s, and we began to get a feeling there were just a few iguanas out there, and we figured maybe 100, 200, something like that. But it got to the point where a lot of development was moving into those areas, and so we decided we needed to do, do a new survey. And it was the most shocking thing um, to, 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 to discover that we went to one place, to the next place, to the next place where we used to know there were iguanas. They weren't there any longer. They weren't there any longer. They weren't there any longer. And we ended up estimating there was maybe 12 left in the wild. It was literally that population had crashed from a couple of hundred to 12 in about nine years. I helped uh, set this thing up with the Trust and the Department of Environment, several international organizations. Uh, we had a big meeting here with the Iguana Specialist Group and, uh, and figured out a plan. And the thing about this plan is it needed someone to, to, to run it. And so I actually took on that role and we, we formed the, the BURP, the Blue Iguana Recovery Program. Our big strategic plan way back in 2001, we said what we wanted to do is try and bring back at least a thousand blue iguanas in the wild. Starting at the beginning, we, we released a bunch of iguanas into the Botanic Park. And in the Botanic Park, they set up these territories, they started behaving like wild blue iguanas. They bred, they laid eggs, and what we did is we collected the eggs and we incubated them, so we got very high hatch rates. And then we reared the young ones for two years before we let them go. And when we let them go, we let them go into places like the Salina Reserve. So they had much more space and we could put out large numbers and we started putting out up to a hundred blue iguanas a year. That was when we were at the peak production. We had to build this huge captive facility at the Botanic Park. Um, it got into like a real industrial-like operation and we had full-time staff there breeding all these iguanas, putting them out in the wild, breeding them again, putting them out in the wild. And then we hit a brick wall because we ran out of space in the Salina. You know, we'd put as many iguanas in the Salina as we figured the Salina could sensibly hold. And we weren't at the thousand mark. And we finally broke through that with the help of an EU grant, which got us the Collier's Wilderness Reserve out in the East End. And then we started putting iguanas out there as well. So now between the Salina and the Collier's Wilderness Reserve and some of the ones that are bred in those places, we reckon we've probably just about hit the, that thousand mark. If we hadn't acted when we did and got the international support that we got at the time, we'd have lost the iguana for sure. It was this close. Whether it's blue iguanas or if it's parrots or if it's endangered snails or whatever else it might be in the world, you know, it all boils down to the same thing. All of these creatures need somewhere to live. If we don't protect natural environments for, for, for the unique Caymanian things that are part of our heritage here, we'll lose them. It was a dedicated group of like-minded people. We had this dream of a botanic park for the Cayman Islands. Margaret Barwick was a great driver of it. Gina Petrie and people like that, and Alison Ebanks. Eventually, it turned out quite, quite good because the park is, 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 is on its own now. It's doing quite well. It's a wonderful place to go and spend a couple of hours just walking and enjoying nature, and I, I still go there all the time, after all this time. One year after it was created, Mr. Kirkland Nixon was elected as the first chairman of the National Trust. 
They elected me as chairman or president at the time, and then we had this huge job of trying to sell the idea of a national trust to the Cayman Islands people. And we went from district to district, time after time, trying to stimulate membership, stimulate interest. We went to and Brock, we went to Little Cayman. The governor's wife uh, was a great supporter. She also drew a lot of people when she came to speak. So it was a very rewarding project, and I, I'm glad we did it. I, I think it's here to stay, and it, it will serve the Cayman Islands very well. The National Trust is an important organization. A lot of Caymanians simply saw our, our flora as bush. Lots and lots of bush. You know, the island was very green and, and, and tickets of, 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 of forests all over the place. But more attention need to be uh, paid to the grassroots Caymanian to, to get him to buy into it. Because once he buys the product, then it's sold. The things that I'm proud of is the oral history project that was started during that period, interviewing the elderly to get their oral history of, of what came on was in their day. I, I think it's an important project. I think we have to get the younger generation aware and involved. But we can't give up, we have to keep at it, you know. Work on the young generation, they get them motivated and then it'll be more successful. It is incredibly important for us to protect all the species and the plants and the historic sites and everything that we have that is unique to Cayman because these things can be found nowhere else in the world. And if it goes missing on our watch, we are the ones that are responsible for that. A few months after the Botanic Park land was acquired, the Trust was gifted another property called Heritage Beach by Charles Adams which is still today one of the only two Trust-owned beachfront properties. This property, along with the Preston Bay nesting site in Little Cayman, will serve as a public beach access for the people in the Cayman Islands forever. I have been involved with the Trust probably about 15 years, but I got more actively involved within the last six or seven years. I enjoyed watching what they were doing, saving properties, trying to save houses, and just spreading the word about culture and how important it is for us to save old buildings, and that is my passion. It teaches us to respect those that came before us long before we were born. Our ancestors sacrificed and they, they did a lot to build up this island, and to me that is very important. Each district has its own uniqueness. The fretwork is different on most of the houses. It even is different to the carpenter, not just the district, but the carpenter, whoever the builder was. There's fretwork that is known to that person. I love old homes. I love old buildings. I think they have a story to tell. I think that they are unique in their own way. Their architecture and their design is cultural and that's something that we need to preserve and I'm very happy that the National Trust is working very hard to do that. The Savannah Schoolhouse first opened its doors to welcome local children on the 12th of September 1940. Children aged from 7 to 14 years all received their lessons in one airy room. It served the community for 41 years, but was eventually replaced by the more spacious and modern building now located just behind it. The National Trust acquired the house in 1991 and has lovingly restored it to its former glory. The graves in the Watler Family Cemetery at Prospect date from the early 19th century, but it may be that the cemetery was being used well before this. The Watler family is one of the oldest in the Cayman Islands, with the original settler arriving in the 1700s. The first lighthouse, one of two on Grand Cayman, the second being in Georgetown, was erected about half a mile away from the present site at Gun Bluff in the early 1900s. By 1918, the need for a more substantial structure was recognized. 
A French engineer named Terrier was appointed to oversee the project. Land at Gorling Bluff was leased from the Connolly family and a new lighthouse was put up, along with a storage shed to hold drums of kerosene. The site was ideal as it was the highest point in the district and commanded a fine view of the local reefs. The new lighthouse was constructed of a steel cylinder mass that supported a wheel-like wooden frame which held a kerosene lamp with three wicks. The lighthouse at Gorling Bluff served until 1937 when the British government gave five modern navigational lights to be erected around the coast of all three Cayman Islands. The lights were to be placed on Crown property, however that same year a law was passed to acquire Gorling Bluff for the Crown. The replacement lighthouse was constructed by Mr. Morell from England and it is this light which serves to the present day. In 1991, the Trust was fortunate to acquire a 100-acre parcel of land on Cayman Brack's Bluff. Mr. Donald Penny, a U.S. citizen, had made a charitable donation of the land to the Nature Conservancy in the USA. As the area was old-growth dry forest with nesting parrots, the Nature Conservancy agreed that the property be transferred to the Trust to form the nucleus of the newly created Brack Parrot Reserve. In 1994, an anonymous donation of 80 acres of nearby land was received, and in 1998, an additional donation by Mr. Penny brought the total protected area to 197 acres. In 2005, the Trust completed the purchase of an additional 84.5 acres of land, connecting the existing parcels. This was possible in part to a grant from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. The grant proposal was written by the Department of Environment in Cayman, who also facilitated the donation of almost $500,000 towards this purchase from the Cayman Islands government. The reserve now encompasses over 280 acres of contiguous protected land. The Brack Parrot Reserve is dominated by pristine ancient dry forests on a very rough and rocky terrain. The Trust Cayman Brack District Committee has established a nature trail through part of the reserve. With the assistance of the local public works department, a small car park was built on Major Donald Drive, the main bluff road which leads to the Bluff Lighthouse. And a ramp was installed to ease walkers' access from the road onto the trail. The trail forms a loop which passes through several different types of terrain, from old farmland, now under grass, past mango trees on red soil, and through diverse thickets into mature forests. The Mastic Reserve was established in 1992 when the government transferred three parcels of Crown land in Northside to the National Trust, thereby protecting the largest contiguous area of untouched old growth forest in Grand Cayman. The Trust continued purchasing surrounding properties to build the robust area that the Mastic Reserve is today. Well, the Mastic Reserve is an area of uh, natural habitat in an almost untouched state. There are very few areas left in the Caribbean where the forests have not been destroyed by man. The, the Mastic Reserve, um, the heart of it, is an area of high ground, very, very rugged, jagged rock, but huge trees grow out of that rock as they evolve to live in those conditions. Because it's jagged rock, if you cut down the trees, there, it would be useless for farmland. Combine that with the fact that the uh, area is so remote that it would be very difficult to haul out the trees for timber, and those two factors have combined to leave the mastic area in a, a natural state, pretty much as it would have been when Christopher Columbus sailed into the Caribbean. The heart of the mastic reserve is a large area of high ground. By high, I mean more than 20 feet above sea level. In fact, it rises up at its highest point to in excess of 70 feet above sea level. Now, 20 feet is a critical number because it's the height that sea level rose during the last series of ice ages in the interglacial periods. Sea level around the world was about 20 feet higher than present. So that means that all of Cayman that is less than 20 feet above sea level would have then been a marine environment, and that occurred about 125,000 years ago. Whereas the Mastic Reserve, the heart of it being more than 20 feet above sea level, has actually been high and dry for going on somewhere between two and three million years. And that is long enough that it has evolved its own unique flora and fauna. 
So the Maastricht Reserve is home to, I believe, all of Cayman's truly endemic species of animals and plants, and that makes it very special. So it's incredibly important for us to have places like the Mastic Reserve and the Mastic Trail in order for us to walk the same path that our ancestors did, for us to have a place where we can feel is um, our ancestral ground, you know, it's, it's a part of our identity. If we don't have these places, we, we kind of don't really know who we are if we don't know our story. And so the Mastic Trail tells a very important part of our story in agriculture, in terms of trade in the Eastern Districts, in terms of um, living on the land. Caymanians did that a lot, and a lot of people don't appreciate that. We had to live from the land back in the day. We don't, we've kind of lost touch with that. It's coming, making a comeback now, but the Mastic Trail is a link between what was and what is today, um, now becoming a more farming um, society. Special places like the Mastic Reserve and the Trail um, allow us to get back to our roots. Soon after its inception, the trust quickly realized that it could not rely on donations of properties alone and would have to establish a funding mechanism to purchase environmentally important properties. Trust Council and members led by the relentless and highly effective Janet Walker raised millions of dollars to buy wetlands, dry forests and shrublands that serve as habitats for our local species and green spaces for our people to enjoy. Former Governor of the Cayman Islands, Michael Gore, served as the first patron of the Trust. He also established the Governor's Fund for Nature, which complemented the Trust's own land reserves fund and facilitated the purchase of important parcels of land to be held under the National Trust. The Governor's Fund was active until the end of Governor Gore's tenure, by which time it had attracted over a quarter million dollars to help preserve habitats for Cayman's nature flora and fauna. One of these areas was named in his honor, the Governor Michael Gore Bird Sanctuary. Situated in the Spots Newlands area of Grand Cayman, it is more often known locally as the Governor's Pond. Although relatively small, just 2.25 acres, the site is representative of a fast vanishing habitat in this rapidly developing area of the island. The Trust has tried to educate the Caymanian people and everybody that comes here on the importance of it, being able to save our historic sites. Um, they have done a fantastic job. There's more to be done because I think education is the key to spread the word and to let people understand that this is something that we need to keep. We need to keep our old buildings. We need to keep our heritage. We need to keep our culture. Just like a parent would do a will or a trust for their child, the National Trust is saving for the people of this country. And that is very important. Tourists want to see our culture. They want to see our historic sites. They want to know what we were like before we became this land that people now know who we are. We used to be called the island that time forgot. The Mission House rose to prominence in the 1800s and became known as the Mission House to early missionaries, teachers and families who lived and contributed to establishing the Presbyterian ministry and school in Bodentown. The Mission House takes you back to an earlier time in Cayman's history by recreating the living situations of the three families known to have owned the home. So the Mission House is the crown jewel of the Trust historic properties. The Mission House is located in Baden Town, which was Grand Cayman's first capital. And it was actually the hub of the community. Uh, it served as a school, as a church, and as a home for missionaries. So it had a very, very vibrant and active role in the lives of the people that lived around the area at the time. And today we are lucky enough to have it in our portfolio of properties. So just as Pedro St. James shares one side of Cayman's story uh, from the past, the Mission House tells um, a complimentary story. So Pedro talks about the formation of government in the Cayman Islands and things from um, a national governmental level. And the Mission House tells a story of education being born in the Cayman Islands. Uh, it served as a home for 
some of the first missionaries to the Cayman Islands, including the Red Paths and the Lions and it was last owned by a Caymanian family called the Wattlers. It's important for us at the National Trust to have brought this place back to life and, and restored it um, lovingly and accurately so that we could tell our children that are in schools now where education was born in the Cayman Islands. So this is one of the birthplaces. Um, Cayman had one room schoolhouses. They didn't have the nice lush campuses that we have today. It was important for the National Trust to restore the mission house so that school children and residents and Caymanians could have a place to go to see what it was like to live in the past, see what our ancestors went through, um, what life was like, and as a way for them to know kind of how Cayman progressed. One of our greatest rewards is seeing young children come through the mission house and they're staring in awe thinking that this could have been their school if they were born in that era. Um, they, they then realized how amazingly blessed they are to have an amazing big school and with electricity and things like that. So this is really a good way to give them some perspective and to understand um, their history. Grand Cayman Central Mangrove Wetland is the ecological heart of Grand Cayman. It is critical to so many important natural processes that the National Trust for the Cayman Islands considers its long-term protection to be one of the fundamental requirements for the well-being of future generations in the Cayman Islands. Approximately 1,500 acres of the central mangrove wetland is protected through the Marine Parks Law, forming part of the environmental zone, which has been in effect for Little Sound and its fringing mangrove since 1986. Efforts are now underway to increase the area of the wetland under protection through conservation land purchase. The Trust has, to date, purchased 765 acres as part of its Central Mangrove Wetland Reserve. Collier's Wilderness Reserve is a National Trust for the Cayman Islands protected area in the District of East End. The European Union's BEST program, a grant funding scheme focusing on biodiversity and ecosystem services which is available to overseas territories of EU member nations, allowed for the establishment of the reserve. As part of the project, the Trust was able to partner with the Cayman Islands government to secure the 190-acre Collier's Wilderness Reserve, which represents ideal habitat for blue iguanas. Colliers features a short, easy walking loop trail through the original growth dry rocky woodland known as Phytocars, where many different species of caiman's plants may be seen. Trees, shrubs, vines, cacti, orchids and mistletoes, which are called scorn the ground in caiman. The area also features fungi, lichens, birds and other creatures. Jackson's Wall is possibly one of the oldest structures in Cayman and may predate the arrival of the John Schreyer Jackson who settled in Grand Cayman around 1770. It is believed the ruins are actually steps that once led up to a large house. Oral accounts indicate that it was supposed to be a two-story home and if that is the case it would certainly put it in the realm of importance with Pedro St. James, Fort George and National Museum building. Immediately after the 1932 hurricane in Cayman Brac, the Eldermeyer House, which sheltered 34 people during the storm, became a center of the community. Because it was one of the very few buildings left standing, people from the communities of Creek and Watering Place were able to get food and support from the Eldermeyer family. Further to the east, the McLaughlin family home also survived and was used as a hospital for the sick and injured. Just off the four-way junction in West Bay, Nurse Yates' house was acquired by the National Trust for the Cayman Islands in 2006, thanks to a generous donation from Maples FS. Originally located near what was Prentice Powell's shop on Boggy Sand Road, the home was moved in 1917 to where it sits today due to beach erosion and hurricane damage. The Waddle and Daub house stands as an example of traditional architectural and construction methods used in Cayman. Such homes were usually set on posts of ironwood with walls constructed of a wattle of interwoven branches filled in with plaster, daub. 
It is said to be the first house in Cayman to have glass windows installed, an event which caused great excitement among neighborhood children, whom Miss Yates recalled gathering outside in order to peer through the panes. The Preston Bay site has extreme environmental significance as it is the largest communal nesting site for the endangered sister island's rock iguana on the western side of the island. Although the sister island's rock iguanas are usually very territorial, the female iguanas nest communally in five specific areas. The Preston Bay nesting site contains almost 40% of the total nests laid each year. Signs placed along the boardwalk explain the terrain and its flora, detailing which plants were important to early settlers. I served in a number of positions, just as a council member, as a legal advisor for the trust, and as the chairman. The trust is really a most necessary organization because it is actually owned by the people of the Cayman Islands. It's a membership-based organization. It actually gives the people a voice as well. So your, your national trust can speak for something that citizens want to see happen, and they can speak against something that its members and citizens don't want to see happen. So it's a vital organization for our community. And I think it's recognized as vital because it's continued to grow over the years. The Little Cayman District Committee is a wonderful example of what a small group of people in a small community can accomplish when they put their minds to it. The site that the National Trust House and Visitor Center in Little Cayman sits on was once the landfill. They raised funds, they lobbied their governor, who at the time was Governor Gore, an avid birder, and through hard work and fundraising, they actually built the visitor center. They got the property, which is mostly pond. So as our islands continue to develop and we get more people from other countries, it's really important that we maintain our natural history as well as our built heritage. It's important for our children to continue learning that and it's important for others who come here to learn what makes us so special. Based on a landlocked saltwater lagoon with mangrove margins leading to old growth dry forest, the Booby Pond Nature Reserve provides a habitat for many types of wetland and shorebirds and a high diversity of native plants. Cayman's only breeding colony of magnificent frigate birds nest in the reserve. The most distinctive aspect of the booby pond, however, is its resident colony of red-footed boobies. With about 2,500 active nests present in the spring of 2010, Little Cayman boasts one of the largest colonies of these creatures in the Western Hemisphere. Unfortunately, the bird is in decline over most of its range, and it is believed by experts that the colony on Little Cayman now represents at least a third of its entire Caribbean and Atlantic population. The importance of this site was recognized in June 1994 when the Booby Pond Nature Reserve was designated as a wetland of international significance under the terms of the Ramsar Convention, an international treaty on the conservation of wetlands. The reserve covers 334 acres which are held in perpetuity for conservation by the National Trust for the Cayman Islands. The remainder, including the southern margins of the pond, are in private ownership, but are protected as part of the reserve under the Cayman Islands Animals Law 2003. This prohibits the disturbance of any form of plant or animal life within the reserve's boundaries. The National Trust is actually one of the most successful national trusts in the Caribbean. A lot of its programs are actually replicated in other countries. For example, the Bat Conservation Program is used as an example all across the Caribbean. They've raised funds, they've formed a program called Iguana Bigona, which is run by volunteers and has been very successful so far. So I think 
they're continuing to raise funds to add to their reserves, but they're also recognizing that there are threats that they can actually address in some way and not leave everything to the government. Volunteering, there's so many ways to get involved in volunteer work. And the more I got involved through volunteering, the more I learned. And, you know, it's amazing how much you actually don't know <laughs> about your own island. I'm still learning things, and it's fantastic. The organization is probably at its most robust than it's ever been. We have 12 staff members, we have multiple sites, we have district committees in most of the districts. We still have to do a few more, but we have uh, very good support from the community. We have about 2,000 members. Again, we still always need more members, but that's where we're at today with about two to three hundred life members. So to date, the National Trust has been able to actually acquire five percent of the important environmental land in the Cayman Islands across all three islands. I think that's a huge accomplishment, but we are very short of the international standard, which is about 10 to 11 percent of lands under protection. Um, so that's where we're going in the future. We're hoping to acquire more and protect more for the people of Cayman. So we've moved from a very grassroots type of organization to a more professional organization and we're trying to use our assets to actually continue to help conservation and preservation in the Cayman Islands. One of the um, programs we started was called Island Offsets in the last year and it's an amazing program where you can actually use carbon uh, credits to actually buy more forests that we need to protect. So it's really, we're really trying to move towards the future way of conservation, even here and right at home. We have nine nature reserves and 12 historic sites across all three islands. So it's taken 30 years for us to amass all the properties that we have. And even though we've done a lot, it's still only 5% of you know, natural land under protection. Uh, we can't take another 30 years for another 5%. We need to speed the process up so much more quickly because development is, is happening all the time. And don't get me wrong, the trust is not against development, but it's actually in favor of sustainable development. And that's harder to come by. So we need to speed up our work by you know, getting more in a, in a shorter period of time. So our, our biggest challenge is trying to get the message out about the work that we do and why it's so important. And we need the people of the Cayman Islands to support the National Trust for the next 30, 40, 50 years because we're doing this on behalf of all of us, you know, and if, if, we, if we don't do it, there's nobody else that's going to come take our place to do it. So it's, we play a vital role here in Cayman and we just need people to come alongside of us and basically journey with us to help save this amazing place that we all call home. So if the Trust were no longer in the picture for some reason, Cayman would really feel the knock-on effects. I mean, we have such an impact on the tourism product here by keeping this place special and unique and beautiful. We also, you know, just the quality of life, standard of living, I believe, would be affected. Uh, we are responsible for keeping Cayman green and having green spaces for people to enjoy forever. So it's more important than ever to ensure that you join the Trust. The more members the better the foundation of the trust. If we do not preserve our culture, who will? If we don't do something to preserve it, it'll be gone. Our hope is that people will find a place in their heart for Cayman. It means everything to me. This is home.